he gets down on the ground. He's fake crying. There's no tears. He's fake crying. He's like, oh, and he's like, hey, she didn't actually get hit by a car. She killed herself. And we were like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So basically my whole, he kept custody of us and raised me and my little sister and our whole lives. He told us that she committed suicide. We both knew it wasn't true, but we also knew that he was the only parent we had and we didn't support him, but we more were like, we have to survive the next 10 years. So how do we get out of this? Of course. Like we have to make him think we believe him. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself And it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? Um, Man, do I have a great episode in store for you guys today. My guest who I get to interview, and this one's going to be a two-parter for you guys because we talked about so much stuff. And of course, as you guys know, I love the sound of my own voice, so I have no problem talking. And uh, we really chopped it up and it was a really great conversation that we have. And we share a lot of really scary similarities in our lives paths. Um, And I really wanted to meet her and talk to her for a long time. So, um, but I'll get to that in a second. I want to get to this week's listener question, and this one's actually like a commentary or maybe even a critique, (laughs) but um, I want to address it because um, it is something that is really important to me and it is something that is really important for me to help you guys really understand as my audience. And I think a lot of you guys gravitate towards me because, you know, there's, you know, of course, the um, Coliseum effect of the sort of true crime element of my show and what I talk about with my own personal story. But there's also the element of where you guys draw a lot of inspiration from me and how I approach my life. That doesn't always land on people the way that I intend for it to land or that I um, or, or that I mean to express it as. And a lot of people also have a lot of difficulties to, uh, grasping some of this material when I discuss uh, my life. So uh, in all fairness, like it is everyone's opinion. They're entitled to what think and say whatever they want to do, because guess what? This is still America and we are allowed to do that. This is land of free speech. So this listener's comment is based upon my Father's Day episode, which is entitled Letters from Prison, a Father's Day tribute to a horrible father, where I really read one of my father's letters from prison that he wrote me many years ago. I'm using it as kind of a a tribute for Father's Day. What can I say? Um, But this one comes from Meg Jones and she writes, you're grateful that you have a father who was abusive and killed your mother? Question mark. My father did the same eons ago, and I am so ashamed and angry and sad that he killed my mother and that I have bloodlines with him. My brother one year younger is the same and sad, angry emoji face. Okay. Now, um, first of all, Meg, I'm really sorry to hear that. That's horrible. And as someone who has been through the same type of trauma, it's, it's not easy to deal with. Um, now here's the thing. I often say on this show, and I talk about it in interviews, <laughs> and I, it's kind of been sort of the mantra of my whole life. I approach all of this, and look, I do this podcast because I am sharing my story with you guys, my audience. It is really one of the things that I, that has come out of this massive tragedy that I've dealt with um, that is really fulfilling to me to share this material because th- the number of listeners and viewers and people not only that, that, that come to the podcast, but came to the podcast through my film and most recently on TikTok, where I share my story in a, in a slightly different way, they really glean a lot of hope 
from my sort of perpetual optimism. And that's sort of my whole way of life and way of thinking. And, and many of my friends uh, come to me <laughs> and, and are, are, when they're down and they're like, you know, hey, I'm dealing with this situation, but you're the perpetual optimist. And I have this sort of knack that I have developed and you can call this a trauma response if you want. You can call this just sort of uh, my mother channeling through me. I like to think in a lot of ways, or you could just call this just sort of my naivete that I pr- approach life with. I don't know. My whole thing is you have two options when you are faced with a situation like this. One is you can embrace it and try to use it to empower yourself and others. The second is you can feel ashamed, embarrassed, depressed, angry, frustrated, just hopeless, right? And, and bitter towards life. I chose the former of those. Um, You know, in the film, A Murder in Mansfield, when I confront my father in prison about murdering my mother, and a lot of people, you know, had reached out to me then when they see the film or when they still see the film, and they say, you know, how can you sit there and, 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 you know, talk to your father and how can you not just get angry and upset? And my thing is, is like, honestly, what fucking good does that do? I mean, I understand that that's sort of like the natural way that we want to get angry. And trust me, like I am angry. I do. I do get angry. Like, uh, of course, the situation that my father put myself, my mother and my family through is absolutely horrific. I am very well aware of that because I lived through it just for the record. (laughs) It wasn't like it just I was there every single step of the way. But I really do feel like if I took all of that and just made that into an anger situation where I just every day feel ashamed, I feel angry and bitter and oh, fuck the world and life owes me something and I'm entitled to a this and that and the other. I learned really early on in my life that that's just not going to work. And it wasn't really in me because my mother wasn't like that. My mother didn't raise me to be that way. And then when I was finally adopted, my adopted parents didn't raise me that way. Um, they were, they were really good about like, you know, not like almost in the opposite. Like, and I learned growing up that I had to embrace that very early on or else it was going to destroy me in life. Now I say all that with the caveat that I am not without my faults (laughs) for sure. 100%. I am human. I am just, I I make mistakes like everyone else. You can ask plenty of the girls that I've dated in life or friends or just, you know, people in general, but I genuinely try to not let these things, I try not to succumb to them. Right. And I feel like that was the good choice for me. I feel like that was the only choice for me, really, because you can embrace these things and try to make them into a positive. Look, I made a film. It impacted, you know, it was originally, I wanted to change my life and impact one person. I wanted to speak to that kid who was on foster care, who was literally had no family, no nothing, and had to testify against his father for doing the most horrible thing to him that he could possibly do and find the courage to do that. I want to speak to that kid who fell alone because I was that kid. And if you guys listened to last week's episode uh, where I replay my interview with Jess McKinley on her podcast, Sincerely Future You, you will get all of that. (laughs) I wanted to do something, but I wanted to be very calculated about it. And I look at all of that And not to sound hooey dewey about it, but I look all of that with a continued state of gratitude. I look through it. I look at it through the lens of optimism and that I am fortunate enough. I have always been fortunate enough to be able to control my own narrative in my life and to be able to use that as a tool to not only better myself, but those around me and, and, you know, just be a little bit of a ray of life in this light in this world. And I know that that speaks to the majority of you guys and my audience, but I know that some people have a hard time hearing that. So yeah, I am grateful because I really genuinely like the person that I've become and that I've grown into being. I didn't always like that person or I didn't always love that person. And sometimes I have my down days and I'm just kind of sad and, oh, life is hard because life is hard. (laughs) Let's just face it. But 
at the end of the day, I am who I am because of my experiences. Do I wish I had an easier life? Absolutely. Do I wish that everything would be roses? Absolutely. But I don't live in a fairy tale and neither do you guys. We live in reality and sometimes life gives you lemons and you can either make lemonade or you can throw the lemons back at the lemonade stand person and say, fuck you, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. That was sort of my... <laughs> That was sort of my process. Um, I, I, you know, I'm being cheeky about all this, but I, and I appreciate Meg. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate where you're coming from. My process is different than yours. I just didn't want to be angry. I didn't want to grow up a bitter and angry person because I'm not, it just doesn't do any good. It's not going to bring my mother back. It's not going to make my father less of a murderer. And it for sure isn't going to change my life. It's just going to make me uh, an angry person. And I know a lot of angry people. They're kind of assholes. I don't want to be an asshole. <laughs> so I chose a different path and I, and I'm happy about that. And yes, I am grateful for it. It sucks the way it had to go down, but I'm grateful for the person that I've become today. I digress. I didn't mean to take that long on this topic, but it is literally the way I look at the world and y'all that know me that listen to this podcast that really know me, that have met me, that have been my role dogs throughout my life. You guys know how I am, how I feel, and you know all the conversations that we've had. So, um, and then to you guys who are a new part of my world, you guys are learning about me and I'm really grateful for that too. Anyways, speaking of flipping one's narrative in life. So a lot of you have discovered the podcast, obviously because of the film of Murder Mansfield, or you've come to the podcast organically, or I, you didn't hear me, you heard me nonstop talking about it ad nauseum, bugging you at some dinner party or something or over a Zoom. Or you discover me on TikTok and you gravitated towards my story, which I was sharing. My next guest is someone whose story I gravitated towards immediately when I discovered her in around February of this year, February, 2022. And her name is Brooke Nicole. Brooke Nicole is also someone who, my God, after like interviewing her, we have so many parallels, which is really exciting. And again, this is a two part episode for you guys. Cause she was a great interview. And not only that, she's also from the Midwest. She's from Indiana. Um, it's very cool. Uh, she is also someone who said in, in a way, well, not in a way, in a very specific way, like I'm going to use the power of social media to bring justice for my mother. And it's really fucking cool. There's another, a friend of mine who's also going to be on the program. Her name is Sarah E. Turney. She's also doing that for justice for her sister. She hosts the podcast Voices for Justice. And um, hopefully I'm going to be on that podcast very soon as well. Um, there are many people that are using social media uh, to bring light to these causes that are often, or at one time were really ignored. And, um, it's really cool. And as someone who spoke up for my mother, when she went missing and said, look, she's not a missing person. She is dead or something has happened to her at the very least. And you police officers need to do something about it. And then David Messmore, by the grace of God, believe me, uh, the word of an 11 soon to be your 12 year old kid that his father killed his mother. Um, it is really cool to see people doing that work. That's all I got to say. So I'm, I'm going to stop blabbering. I'm going to let you guys listen to this wonderful interview that I have had with Brooke Nicole, who I discovered on TikTok. And here's Brooke. So I've discovered you on TikTok because you were telling the story of your mother's disappearance and what you believe to be your father's involvement in her murder. Yeah. Is that correct? So, um, I started on TikTok about a year ago, but I just started with that story and then not the broader context of it. Um, but basically I was, um, my parents met in 1989. They got pregnant with me very quickly. Uh, my mom had a, had a kid. My dad was in, um, I think his intern year or residency cause he was also a doctor. Um, and then they moved, um, as soon as he got out of that, I, I can't remember which year it was, but, um, when I was two, they moved from Indiana to Oklahoma and my mom didn't know anybody in Oklahoma. It was like 800 miles away from her family. Everyone she knew was in Indiana and, um, both of my parents are from Indiana, just different small towns. And we moved down there and then probably... Three years later, when I was about five, I had a little sister as well. She's 10 months younger than me. But um, 
When I was about five, my dad got in trouble um, because a patient came forward and said that he touched her inappropriately and she was 17. So she was, yeah, she was in foster care. And so nobody really believed her because they had this bright young doctor, you know, who was brilliant and like a big part of this community, this small town. And um, he had preyed on someone that nobody would believe. Our parallels are very are scary similar. Yeah. This is crazy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I didn't know. It gets more, it, yeah, it gets more, it gets more paralleled actually later. It's crazy. But um, he ended up losing his license, I believe, in Oklahoma. And so we moved to Illinois, like the border of Indiana and Illinois. He didn't lose his license in Indiana because they, at the time, they didn't talk. It was the mid 90s. So he still had his license in Indiana. So he worked in Indiana. Um, and then he got fired and lost his license in Indiana when I was like eight for um, stealing drugs from the ER. He was an addict. So he stole drugs from the ER. So your father was an addict. Yeah, he was an addict, um, prescription drugs. And so he tried to go to rehab a couple times, okay. never worked. He would write his own scripts, things like that. Um, like opi yeah, opioids? heavy stuff. And then he pretty much did everything. We're still in Oklahoma. Sure. He's under investigation for assaulting this woman. Child. She's 17. She's a child. Yeah, child. she's a child. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's under investigation for that. My mom finds out in November about this. So it happened in like, I want to say September. My dad knew about it for a couple months without saying anything to my mom. My mom finds out about it in November because that's when the police pull me and my little sister out of school and, and start interviewing us. And the whole town finds out because these kids are getting pulled out and questioned, right? I was in first grade. Sure. It's a bold move. That's a bold move. Cause it's a small town. And when you yep. do something like that, it's mm -hmm. like, they know. Yep. <laughs> and uh, it was a big deal. So that's when my mom finds out November, February, she's dead. So it's all going, it's all like happening. That whole investigation is happening. Um, at one point in December, my dad just takes off, leaves, tries to drive to Alaska to see someone who was his mistress at the time. She was 16. Um, it's he doesn't make it all the way there. They stop him in Canada, turn him around because he it's it's a hot mess. But he comes home. So he they, they stopped him in Canada at the Canadian border, border because of the pending yes. issue with the underage seventeen yep. year old. And he was he trying had. to flee the country. But now, he, did he give her? Did he give her physicals? Was mm -hmm. that the the thing that yeah. he was the, under the guise of yep. giving her a physical? Wow, very similar so to my they, father. <laughs> they actually caught him um, because they sent her in with a wire by herself at seventeen, and he apologized to her for doing it. Yeah the Ooh. bravery so she had already reported it and then wow, the bravery that's... of that girl like especially when the whole town was against her like it's insane to me how brave she had to be like to do that to go back in that room by herself and confront him for it and she did and she wore a wire and so um he pled he pled no contest to it lost his license but as this all was going on um my mom and dad um, were having money issues because they were fighting this or whatever. And she had planned on like coming up to see her family in Indiana. And my family, like my mom's family to this day says that they think that she was going to leave him because she was taking the girls on this trip to see her family, you know, sure. and they, Makes her sense. family had no idea any of this was going on. She told them nothing. And then one day, um, she, I remember this very clearly, the, like the last night she was alive, we were in her, in her bathroom going through jewelry that was her mom's. And she was like showing us keepsake. Her mom died when she was eight. So she's like going through all these keepsakes and showing them to us and what they mean. And I'm six and my little sister's five and my big sister's 15. So we're all like sitting in a circle in this big bathroom, like going through all this jewelry and stuff. And then my dad comes in and my mom is instantly like, go to bed. My dad's angry and like sees what we're doing and gets angry. And I'm like, was she trying to figure out what to take? Cause this trip was the next week. 
So that's my thought on it. But um, basically we all went to bed and my mom would sleep with me because I was a sleepwalker. So she would usually spend some time with my dad and then co eventually come up and go to bed with me because they were afraid. I'd ended up outside before I'd ended up on top of the counter. Like I was, it was dangerous. So they were like, just someone needs to sleep with this girl so that nothing happens. Right. So yeah. Wow, so okay. she usually came up and I noticed she wasn't coming up. This is why I don't take Ambien by oh, the way. Oh, I, yeah, I do take Ambien. So <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, Sorry, no, I had to light in the moment. Go it. ahead, go ahead, so please. She used to, so I went downstairs looking for her because she hadn't come up in a while. I was reading the Boxcar Children, and it was usually longer than I was allowed to read. So I was like, what's going on? Um, knocked on the door, and she kept, like, she wouldn't open the door, which was very odd. She wouldn't open the door to her room, and she was like, go upstairs. Go upstairs, go to bed. I love you, go to bed. I'll be right up, go to bed. And I'm like, okay. So she was really insistent through, through the, the door. door. And I like got on the ground and looked under the door and I could see her feet next to the door. And then my dad's feet were maybe six feet behind her. And I was just like, that's weird. And then I went upstairs, laid in bed. And then I heard a little while later, two gunshots. And um, I didn't really know what was going on. And then I saw lights dancing like in the front, in my window, like red, white, and blue lights. So I went down, I tried to creep downstairs to see what was going on. And I saw my dad covered in blood. I saw people around him cleaning him up. And I saw my big sister and she said, go to bed. And I said, what happened? And she said, dad cut his finger. And I was like, that's too much blood for a finger. And she said, mom got hit by a car at Walmart, go upstairs. She was scared. She didn't know what to say. And she didn't want me to come downstairs and see my mom's body. Sure. Of course. Of that course, was her because yeah. she had oh. to see it and she did not want me to see it. So that was her biggest thing was say something to get this girl to go upstairs. Like, um, so I went upstairs and then, um, a few hours later he woke me up and said, mom got hit by a car. Um, you're going to a babysitter's and he dropped us off of the babysitter's and, the next morning, my little sister woke up and no one told her anything. So they were like, you can tell her. So I had to tell her our mom was dead. And I told her, I said, I guess I was, she says, she remembers this way more clearly than I do. And she said that I said, mom's dead. Do you want to play connect four? Cause I was trying to like distract her and not make her sad. And she didn't understand what it was. And I was like, let's just go in another room. And so we left the room where everybody is like, not okay. I, I mean, my, at this point, my dad's nowhere to be found. I don't know what happened, but eventually he came and got us. And at the babysitters in the foyer of the babysitters, he gets down on the ground. He's fake crying. There's no tears. He's fake crying. He's like, oh. and he's like, Hey, she didn't actually get hit by a car. She killed herself. And we were like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So basically my whole, he kept custody of us um, and raised me and my little sister and our whole lives. He told us that she committed suicide. And when I was, we all, we both knew it wasn't true, but we also knew that he was the only parent we had and we didn't support him, but we more were like, we have to survive the next 10 years. So how do we get out of this? Of like, we have to make him think we believe him because there's no other, like, otherwise we're not going to eat. You know, he was very abusive. He was horrible to us, but we were like, we have to survive till the end of this until we can turn 18. Like that was essentially it. But when I was 15, um, he got arrested like a week before Christmas um, for molesting another child, but who was not his patient. It was one of my friends. And that's what he ended up going to prison for for a year. So that's actually what ended up getting us out of his custody. Yeah, because I guess you would have been 16 yeah. by the time he got out. And you can sort of, I think in, in Indiana is like you can file for yeah whatever i moved is. yeah independence or whatever, i actually yeah. ended up going in with like a foster family 
who I mm-hmm. I got so lucky. They're awesome. They're they I knew them beforehand, and um, I guess legally at the time, and I we were in Illinois, and you had to have a spare room if you were going to take in a child that was about to go into the system. So to keep us out sure. of the system. Um, we were like, where can we go? So we had to split up because who has two spare rooms, you know? Sure. Um, but we didn't want to go into the actual system. So she ended up living with her best friend and then eventually moving in with one of our uncles. And then I ended up going in with this family that um, I knew through the internet actually, <laughs> but it ended up working out. Um, and they're like still family to me. So I lived there until I turned 18. That's amazing. Now you're, so this is your sister. She's 10 months yes. younger than you. She goes to another home. And then what happened to your, your older sister who was what, uh, nine years older yeah, than she's you guys? Nine. So yep. she's in her twenties by now. Yep. So when all this went down and then you're in your father's care, obviously she was still there. Now, was she from a previous yes. marriage of yes. your mother's or mother's. father's? She's my, mm-hmm. So she was your mother's Correct. daughter. So she what happened to her like what is that like Like, i'm not entirely sure like where i know she bounced around for a second with some people because she wanted to stay in oklahoma for a while because she that's where her life was and her family was and she was in high school so she wanted to stay in oklahoma um so i know she lived with some people in oklahoma for a while some family friends um and then she ended up coming up to indiana and she actually lived with us for a while like my dad remarried for a hot second like a good three or four months um and she lived with us then (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) so where was her father and all this your mother was your mother's ex-husband yeah i don't boyfriend it was her ex-husband but um they weren't really on good terms at the time so they're much better now your mother had full custody of her your mother had full custody of her at the time <clears throat> so okay so do you have a relationship with your yes, older sister i do yep yeah she um she is she's doing really well she, i mean now she's in her 40s so you know um and she's married she's been with the same guy since high school and they're married and they have a kid and okay. she's doing really well um but yeah she had a hard time because um she bounced around for a little bit and then she ended up sure. living back with us for a while um because I think that at the time, like none of us really knew what was going on, but we didn't really want to be away from each other, you know? So like she did kind of try to protect us for a while and then it got to be too much, I think for her and she had to get out. So she actually moved out on her own and um, probably the best thing she could have done. Sure. Yeah, she's awesome now. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's so many bizarre parallels here. I think that I, I think it, it's very reassuring to me. And is, this is definitely proof for anyone that's listening. Like you, I, you know, before this, we talked mm-hmm. on the phone for almost an hour. Right. I've seen your TikToks. You are a very functional, um, uh, you know, courageous adult living and sharing your story and being, um, you know, being out there with it. But like, you're you're an example that you can go through the, these extraordinary circumstances that, you know, this, this trauma. And obviously like we're, 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 everyone's fucked up, right? I'm sure you have your issues just like I do. I mean, (laughs) uh, you know, uh, I mean, for sure. But um, I think for the most part, a lot of people glean a lot of hope from looking at the, us and going, if they can right. make it, we can too, which is a cool thing. So it's really refreshing to to see that. So what did the, at that time, mm-hmm. is it just, oh, she killed herself and that's what the police were accepting? No, uh, not uh, really. Uh, at the time? They all, um, they all knew he did it, but they couldn't prove it everything they had was circumstantial and um because he was cleaned up he never did um a gunpowder residue test he never did a lie detector he never did anything he was cleaned up before they even got there by the paramedics who worked with him um so it was it was kind of a hot mess um there were a lot of things like there are a lot of weird things like her body was room temperature so it's like how long did he wait to actually call 
Um, he called from two different phone lines so that he, he made like four phone calls before he actually called the police. Um, things like that. He, but they were like, we can't prove it, but it does say that, um, the cause of death on her death certificate is, um, it doesn't say suicide. Um, it doesn't say homicide. It doesn't say suicide. I think it says, um, um, unknown like death by gunshot. Wound yeah. But like, like it says unknown, it does say death by gunshot, but it does, it says unknown and she was medicated. Um, and, uh, yeah, like heavily medicated. Um, did your mother have a substance abuse no, problem no. as well? And so she was, was she medicated? <laughs> was that something she was no. normally doing? No. And we also, um, my little sister, for oh. the record, like my little sister did not wake up at all through people carrying her downstairs, through like driving a car, through being put in the baby. So she never woke up and she was a light sleeper. Um, and my dad did have a history of um, drugging us for long road trips, the, the little kids, because he was like, oh, well, you know, that way we can get somewhere faster if they sleep through it. So... Um, that's not an unknown thing. He was not ashamed of that. So it's just kind of like, I don't know if he drugged her or not, but she was not prescribed any of those pills and she did not have a substance abuse problem. Wow. And the autopsy report, like uh, his stories, none of them made sense, you know, because you don't try to kill yourself and miss. Why was there a bullet in like <laughs> another wall? Like that doesn't happen. Well, or somebody does miss while trying to kill themselves but it's the gun slips and shoots their right, nose off or something right. it's not like uh it's not like a boom oh it didn't uh, you know because normally yeah. you know and for people who you know are listening who may not have fired a firearm discharging a firearm is a very scary mm -hmm. thing it's very loud there's action that goes on the gun it's it's i always i have my own theories about gun violence yeah. but um, I, uh, uh, it's definitely something that you take notice of. Right. It's not like, oh, okay, oh, I missed. Let me try this yeah. again. It's a little like jarring, yeah. even when you're shooting a pop can. <laughs> yeah, and she was terrified <laughs> of guns. Like she didn't want them in the room. She'd never yeah. touched one. Like she was very terrified of guns. Um, and the gun actually left burn marks. The barrel left burn marks in the back of her throat. It was shoved in so far. So there are just certain things that are like, really? But that really, you think really? I don't know. There are just a lot of little things like that where we're all kind of like, no, you, you, you did it, bro. <laughs> like you, you did it. But um, also they had a lot of issues with it. And you grew up knowing this, like knowing in your heart that your father murdered yes. your mother. Absolutely. And I, it's weird because we knew, but we couldn't, you know, I didn't know a lot of the details um, that I do know now growing up. I didn't know there were two, like, we, we, you were six, you were six. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of it was kept from me. You were six. Um, yeah. A lot of it was kept from me because um, my mother's family knew that if they said anything to us, he would never let us um, go over there. He'd never, never let them see us again. And they were under the impression we believed him because we were his kids. Well, nobody ever asked us if we believed him. We knew better, you know, sure. but we were also like, but you know, no one's going to take us away from him because we've tried that and it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's interesting how you, you, there's so many things going through my head, but just to pick up on your point, they didn't ask you, they just assumed right. that you were, you know, that you believed something. Right. It's, it's interesting because I, my, one of the sort of things with my uh, relatives that abandoned me was you, they, there was this, um, well, we just figured you would work it out or you would, mm -hmm. or you felt this certain way. And it's like, nobody ever right. asked me, Right. You, you know what I mean? Nobody, if you bother to take, take the time to check in with me, and say, hey, how are you feeling? Even, how are you feeling, Collier? That's all I would have needed. Just, hey, how are you feeling? How are you handling this? What's going on? Um, but they never did that, right? And the second thing that, that's going through my head is, I'm thinking about my situation. 
my father being in court. Mm -hmm. And again, you mentioned circumstantial. It's the parallels are so bizarre because, you know, your father was a doctor and, you know, I'm sure that people would say, well, how, if, he, if he did this, how would the evidence, just like with my father, why was there no blood? Why was there no this? Well, because first of all, like when they found my mother's body, it was 25 mm -hmm. days later, right? Under the house that I alerted them to. But also you have, uh, you know, you have somebody who deals with blood. Like my father worked, did surgeries and was dealing with, like they know how to clean themselves. Right. <laughs> like they know how to wash, the, they know how to get rid of these things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? At least to a certain, at least to a point where it's not gonna be traceable. And let's face it, this happened, when, when was 1997. yours? 1997. So 1997, mine was 1989 slash 1990. So you have, you have nowadays the, the criminologists, the forensicologists, the forensics has changed so much, even from 1997 to now. What is that? 25 yeah. years later. Jeez, 25 years. I know, 25, right? 25 years. Um, 25 years later, you know, even now we're having these advancements that you know it would be much easier to pick up on all of this, but you didn't have mm -hmm. that, and um, it, you know, there's this sort of forensic science that's available and available at a cheaper cost because you're not dealing with the Los Angeles. Metropolitan right. Police Department, you're not dealing with the city of New York, you're dealing with, you know, small town Indiana that doesn't have like their local crime lab and, and on staff, you know, DNA specialist, you know, that can analyze things and bullet trajectory analyst and things like that where, so they don't have the resources, yeah. right? And so it's very easy, I feel, for someone in those positions, like our fathers, to manipulate those situations because they don't have that ability and it's like you know you're talking about he made four phone calls right well you know in a murder in mansfield my father says well you know which is different than the testimony right. of witness stand which testimony of witness stand she got a new thing he tried to say that he did cpr on her performed cpr on this and somebody said well why didn't you ask him about calling 911 and i was like well really was there any point to that like really would that have been the game changer in this thing we're like oh i didn't call 911 it's like no i asked him why there's a plastic bag over his head he said i put the plastic bag over her head yeah <laughs> you know he's already admitting right. to what he did um you know but it's like of course are you why why wouldn't you phone emergency mm -hmm. services immediately if this is what happened right. why are you it's it's just it's it's uh sus as the kids mm -hmm. say it is um, sus <laughs> But it is sus. But uh, I shudder to think of what had ha what would have happened if my father had gotten off for murdering my mother, and then I had to go back and live with him because I would have been twelve years old at the time, going back into his custody, which I would assume would have right. happened. I would have gone back to his custody because it's you very can't hard. Yeah, to, I believe it's fight impossible. That. They, tr my family tried for years, but they couldn't can't kill parental rights if no one doesn't want to give them up. Yeah, exactly. And it's like one of the hardest things. And I know I have a friend that works in child services. Um, and he said that that is like um, their version of an appeal. Mm -hmm. But on the child's right side is when they they file these either the, the parents. And he, you know, he deals with parents that right. are drug addicts, right? That are literally opioid addicts that cannot take care of mm -hmm. themselves, let alone their family. And they will file these these um, injunctions to to maintain their parental rights because it's sort of like the death sentence for them if those are oh, taken yeah. away, right, with their children. For many reasons, like it could be because they want custody of their children, it could be because they want welfare from mm -hmm. the state, it could be because they, it, they, there's all these things that come with it, right, so they fight this. And he's, it's just very, very yeah. difficult to prove that even when the child is in danger, right? Oh yeah, so, even when the man is, has a history of molesting young girls and then you're gonna put two young girls in his care by himself for the next 10 years, they can't do anything about it. And none of that ever, I mean, not to be uncouth, but none of that ever happened in your immediate no, family. No, um, There were some weird okay. things that happened, but nothing, there was no touching or anything. Let me ask you on that note, like, so my father was uh, accused of molesting my two cousins under the guise of giving them physicals mm -hmm. a couple of years before my mother was, before he murdered yep. my mother, right? And those girls, because of their age, they just couldn't, and because of the, just the, traumatic effects of something like that could not you know, give evidence against my like they just they just couldn't handle it which is no right. judgment on them like right. you're a child like that is a horrible thing mm -hmm. to deal with um 
you know, a lot of people ask me, well, was there a sign of that? Did he do that to you? And I, and no, like there was none of that. I, but I do remember my father talking to me with my mother in the room about mm -hmm. sexual mm -hmm. predators, which is so ironic. And like showing me if somebody touches you mm -hmm. here, if somebody, it was very, you know, it was very anesthetized. Right. It was very like, yeah, this is what, if somebody does this. And I do remember one time we were in a mall in Philadelphia, suburban Philadelphia. And I was probably like 10 years old. This was a couple of years before you before murdered my mother. I went to the urinal. I was like starting to be that age where right. you could go to the bathroom by yourself. So I was using the urinal and somebody dropped a note over my, over my shoulder. And it said, um, I just want to like something like, I want to touch you. And I, and I freaked out. And I, um, I came out of the restroom and I gave it to my, my parents, of yeah. course, like, as I, I, I said, this is what somebody gave me. And I just remember my father going into who, who had no problem, you know, turning on rage right, at the right. top of a hat, uh, went into full on rage mode. And he just, he just started storming through wherever store we were at. I didn't see him for like an hour. I think cause he went like looking yeah. for somebody or something, you know, I think that, so it's very, it's very interesting. It's like here he's perpetrated something on another, on these girls. Right. But then when it came to his own child, you know, it, it, like there's a boundary that you don't cross. Right. Yeah. It's very bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe he was putting on a show for my mother. I have no idea to say, Oh, I'm innocent of these things. I, I, I don't know, but I do, but there was none of that that occurred in my childhood with my father. I mean, at least not to my recollection. Yeah, like mine, <laughs> you know? um, no, he, I do know there were a couple times um, he would get excited around me. Um, okay. And he would like leave, you know, he'd like leave the room. And I, but I was like, I'm not dumb. I know what's going on, you know? Um, and it, that there were things like that. But um, I do know like one of his brothers came to live with us for a while. And this was right before, um, right before he got arrested, it was like the fall before, because he got arrested by around Christmas when I was like 15. So the fall before, okay. um, one of his brothers came to stay. I don't know what really was going on with that, um, but he would make really inappropriate comments to me all the time and like say things. And then we were at a Walmart one time and he like grabbed me very inappropriately when no one's the brother. The brother. Yeah, Your uncle. my uncle yeah. did. And I said something to my dad. And my dad didn't believe me. He's like, why would you do this? Why would you say this about my brother? His brother, who had also been to prison for molesting children, who also had a history of it. And he didn't believe me. And I was like, I swear to you, this is happening. And he's like, well, I'm picking him over you because you're a little liar. You probably asked for it. And I was like, okay. And like that, I was so done. <laughs> like, I was like, great. Like, but yeah, I, that was the only thing that ever happened in a bit. And like literally a month later, he was arrested. So I was like, okay. But that was, I've never, I will, that is something I'm like, uh-uh, believe, believe us. You'll yeah. never forget. So I was like, not only do you do it, you can donate being done to your daughter, just not by you. And I do know there were pictures taken of me at random times. Um, but I do know that that's part of like the, um, the culture you have, sometimes you have to present pictures that are inappropriate in order to get pictures that are inappropriate in that, in that ring of culture. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So I know that there were pictures of me taken um, when I was growing up that were inappropriate, but that's about it. By your, by yeah. your father, mm -hmm. by, by, oh, oh. So he never touched me. So but... he would use those as, so he would, so you believe that your father would use those photos as a sort of currency to obtain yeah. other photographs. I do. Jesus Christ. But that's all, I mean, yeah, that, that's something that like I'm still working through, but I also like I I'd forgotten about it until semi recently too. Like because I there were so much sure. things, like so much that something like that I'm like I don't even care. Like I do, but that's the least of 
it's the tip of yeah. the guy. It's like it, it, it would be devastating for most people, but you're just like, if that's the if that's the, the least yeah, of my problems. Yeah, I'm okay. exactly. I'm, I'm like, good, I, I'm good I'm with like, that. I'm like, that's the <laughs> yeah. one I, I I've got other fish to fry, and they're bigger. So, I mean, it's it's hard to under it's sort of hard to reconcile all of this when you think about yeah, like his own brother. It, it, like it runs in the family. Oh yeah, multiple brothers of his have ha had that happen. Like. It's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole thing. That's to say the to say the least. I know that my dad watches my TikToks uh, because his family told him about them, and then they told me that they told him about them. And um, I don't talk to anybody on that family. Like I don't know them, so I don't really associate that much. Um, but I did get like an angry phone call from an one of his sisters when all this went down because of what I was doing to her family and I just needed to let it go and stuff like that um, because people were asking her about it in the grocery store and I was like not my problem but uh, when it comes to like knowing I didn't know where my dad was for the last 10 years until TikTok he could have been anywhere it's interesting you what you just said where they come up to you and they're saying, or the people are coming up to me in the grocery store asking me about this. People are, uh, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. for me. It's whatever their, their thing is. And look, I am in no way, shape or form advocating, um, or saying that it's not difficult or challenging, um, being in their situation, right? right? It's also rather difficult and challenging to be in your situation. Correct or my situation. And so I would have, again, this, like the, the, I think for me, how I can relate this is because I only recently started telling my story on TikTok. and look, you know, it's sort of prologue to my life now, I guess, I guess maybe yeah. that, that's the, that's the word I'm looking for past is prologue for me. Um, I mean, I think as, as you, as you too, but I also think that, um, you know, one of the things when I made a murder in Mansfield is I gave everyone that I could the opportunity to speak in the film, whether that be my father's mistress, my, my half sister, everybody, I reached out to everyone. And I said, you know, I said, look, you know, I met with her in her house and I said, this is an opportunity for you to share your side of the story, whether that side of the story is, you know, because people will draw their own conclusions based upon the facts that are presented, right. right? This is your opportunity to say, look, I didn't know about his wife. I signed this piece of paper with her name on it uh, for the house because Jack told me to do this and I was under his control right. or whatever that is, right? And instead they chose not to participate at the last second and my sister pulled out. I haven't spoken to my sister since, like not because of me, because of her, right. like she just, you know, I was uninvited to my nephew's birthday party that I was invited to three days earlier and all these things. And so it just evaporated right when I was making the film. So I, um, and what happened is, is after the film, then they were upset. Well, you know, call your, I, I don't know why he did this. And my, I, I couldn't believe that my adopted parents actually did this because they were very close, not close, but like they wanted to always cultivate a relationship with my half sister's family. And they said to me, you know, they, there was something that was really important for them and whether or not I was happy about it growing up and seeing this woman in our house and talking to her because I very much was like, you know, you are at the epicenter of right. all of this. Um, you know, you were my father's mistress and you had a baby, right. like, you, you know, all these things, right. At the same time, you know, I did feel that she was an innocent pawn and, and now, I mean, innocent to a certain degree. Right. Or, or she maybe had been opportunistically. She was 27 yeah. years old. Like, yeah, <laughs> and pregnant and a doctor and he's very charming and he's already a narcissist and a sociopath. So there's the love bombing, the gaslighting, all these things. Right. And she, you know, it's very easy for people to be manipulated. It's still easy for people oh, yeah. to be manipulated, even at my, my, my age. And I'm just like, you know, I, I think that I didn't blame her anymore. I kind of realized, okay, well, you know, as uncomfortable as this makes me, I need to get over this because she's also a victim here too. But one of the things that my, she went to my adoptive parents and was like, well, you know, I don't understand why he did this. And now I have this and that and the scrutiny. And he's like, the, my adoptive father said, George says, well, look, he gave you the opportunity right. to speak. Collier came to you before this happened and said, this is an opportunity. Like, 
a year <laughs> before any of this happened and said, Hey, and then a couple months before came to your house and said, Hey, I want you to understand that this would be a great opportunity. If you want, I'm giving you this opportunity. I don't want to tell your story. I don't want people to draw any conclusions based upon not having the facts or hearing your side of the story because people are going to look at this and feel a certain right. way. And then when they, they didn't choose that opportunity and then they were like, well, I'm innocent. And they, well, why is this happening to me? It's like, well, you were given the opportunity, right? Yeah. To create your own I would context. Say your story is like you have the, the choice uh, to. Exactly. So I, I think that, you know, when your your family or or father's side of the family comes to you and they're like, well, this is a problem. And it's like, well, well, yeah, but what have you been? I mean, I would my response, I think, would be, well, yeah, but I'm now just bringing things to light. Yeah. Um, why haven't you done the same thing? Yeah. And why would you think as her daughter that I'm going to let this go? Yeah, I think for me, um, I've met his side of the family once in my life. I was eight years old. Um, growing up, he told me his parents were dead. They were not dead. Um, like he had nothing to do with his family. He didn't talk to him for like 20 years. And then I found out he had all these brothers and sisters and they all had kids, but I've met them one time. And then, you know, they've never really shown any interest in my life or getting to know me or anything like that. And he got out of prison um, when I was like 16. He went in when I was 15. He was only there for a year. And he went back and started living with his family. And because he didn't really have anywhere else to go. And I didn't really want anything to do with him then. So I wasn't really around then either. But then I start doing this stuff and I start getting these phone calls that are like, you're ruining our lives. Like you need to let it go. It's so long ago and all this stuff. And I'm, and then I got the, I'm so disappointed in you. We're all so disappointed in you. And I was just like, cool. I don't, I, I, that's fine. You can be disappointed in me, but I'm not disappointed in myself for doing this. And I didn't bring you into it. Like I never said your name. I never said anything about sure. you. Like to where you would need context. I wasn't like, oh, everyone's supportive of him. I never said a thing. But you doing that means you are because you don't want it to affect your life. But like, I grew up without my mom. Thank you so much for doing this. I, we've reported for like, you're the longest interview I think I've ever had. <laughs> Told you a lot of similarities. <laughs> it is so eerie down to like the doctor and, and the, the behaviors and just the complete and sheer utter hubris and narcissism of people is staggering to me it's so it's so i mean I, my heart breaks for her um and you know but the cool thing is is to listen to her story and how she very calculatingly you know said i'm gonna do something with this much like myself i mean in a different way i got into entertainment you know, uh, because I'm an artist and that's what I do. And, but Brooke was determined to, to not let this just not to sit idly by and literally put her ducks in a row. And it's so amazing to see someone do something so cool with social media, with, with something that, you know, she is so passionate about this and, and to really have justice, to, to really bring justice for her mother. I commend her. It was. I'm so excited that this is a two-parter because I just love talking to her. She's so cool. I hope that you guys really uh, gleaned a lot from her story and that you guys see the parallels that I talk a lot about in this program and you guys get, you know, get to hear from someone else and look, you know, again, as she says, she's not without her faults and her issues and her days, but it's okay. You know, we, um, you know, we are all going to make it. And, and I hope that like by hearing my story, by hearing Brooke's story, by hearing other people's story, T Sarah Turney, Tara Newell, you guys know and are learning that you guys can make it through anything. And if we can, you can do it too. Um, this is not like meant to be a pep talk, but it is a little bit, I guess. I don't know. I'm guilty of it, but you know, I'm going to shut up <laughs> and I'm going to say, uh, I'm Collier Landry and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. 
The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.